So we as economists in wanting to say something useful about uh, particular markets or uh, particular policies um, want to be able to quantify how well consumers are doing, how well producers are doing, and how well the combination of consumers and producers are doing. Um, and this is, allows us to compare and contrast different policies and um, you know different market structures and uh, see does this this policy make sense or um, should we try to increase the number of uh, producers should we subsidize production in this particular market or something like that but the first step is to understand uh, who's gaining and by how much so remember if we go back to the trade lectures as long as there's uh, different opportunity costs, um, there's comparative advantage, and that comparative advantage leads to gains from trade. Okay, And that, that goes for every market, whether it's international trade or whether it's, um, you know, I'm buying hot dogs from you. I'm trading you cash for a hot dog. Um, and, um, you know, there's some underlying opportunity costs for my cash. It, it stands for the hours I put into um, working for like, working for a nonprofit versus um, you know time I could have spent sleeping. Right, the opportunity cost of my time. So the the cash will proxy for my opportunity cost, and I'll pay you and um, you know somewhere somewhere between my opportunity cost of my job and your opportunity cost of producing the hot dog um, will be uh, the price of the hot dog. And depending on what I'm willing to pay and what you're willing to sell it at, um, the closer it gets to our opportunity cost, right, the the more or less uh, we've gained. So if, it go, if the price of the hot dog is exactly equal to the opportunity cost of my time, the, the, the wage that I earned, um, then I'm not going to benefit from, from, you know, buying the hot dog, I'm not going to lose, but at, relative to my opportunity cost, I could have just made the hot dog myself. But if it's any bit lower than my opportunity cost, I, I gain from it. I get what's called the consumer surplus and I'll define it later. But basically if I'm willing to pay more, um, for a hot dog, than I actually have to pay for it. I gain from it. And if you're willing to sell a hot dog at less than what you actually receive from the price, um, then you as the seller gain from it. And we want to be able to quantify how much does the consumer gain from this trade? How much does the, does the producer gain from this trade? And that's this whole branch of welfare economics. Okay. So that's what we're trying to do here. So we want to see, does an equilibrium allocation affect the well-being of uh, consumers and producers and by how much? Okay. So we call, uh, you know, this particular, um, you know, method or, or, or practice in economics, welf uh, welfare economics, which is basically studying how well um, how well consumers and producers are doing in a market, how, how the gains from trade between producers and consumers um, are divvied up. Okay, so generally buyers and sellers benefit from market equilibrium. Remember, there are gains from trade to be had as long as there was some sort of specialization, as long as there's a division of labor based on comparative advantage, okay? It doesn't make sense for me to, you know, make every laptop that I'm going to use because the opportunity cost of making a laptop for me is uh, much higher than the opportunity cost of doing a bunch of economics lectures um, such that I can get paid and buy a laptop, okay? Um, Basically, I've saved myself some time, which is valuable to me, um, by producing an economics lecture, which allows me to pay for the laptop, versus building a laptop on my own, which would be very costly for me because I have no idea how to do it. Um, so I've benefited from buying the, the laptop with my cash. But, um, you know, we want to be able to quantify by how much have I benefited. Okay. Um, markets, uh, in general, again, are, are beneficial. And one of the reasons that they're beneficial is because there's voluntary participation for every transaction. Um, so essentially, there's no, nobody's forcing you at gunpoint to buy it. 
to buy the laptop. Um, if I buy a laptop, it's because the opportunity cost of making a laptop is higher than what it, what it would actually cost me to buy the laptop on the market. Um, so in that sense, it's voluntary. Of course, there's stipulations. Uh, you know, is it really voluntary that um, someone, you know, buys at least the raw ingredients for food? Is it really voluntary um, that people buy, you know, health care? Uh, for necessary operations? Is it really voluntary that people have housing and shelter and internet? Um, but, you know, necessity aside, by and large, uh, there's voluntary participation in the market. And even for these cases, um, you can make a pretty clear argument that, sure, it might not be voluntary that I have... Um, that I have a procedure on, that I have a, a malignant tumor removed from my from my body, right? That's not something that's voluntary. I pretty much have to do it in order to survive. But it's still beneficial in the sense of if I had to remove it myself, what would that take? It would take like six years of medical school and, uh, you know, being able to do the operation or, or whatever, and some residency and all that. Uh, versus, you know, a, a very expensive amount of uh, money that I'm paying, but probably less so than I would pay to learn how to remove it myself. Um, so in that sense, even though the market might suck, it might be something that's, you know, terrible for the consumer, um, it's still probably beneficial in the sense of versus doing it yourself, yeah, that you're benefiting from the market. Um, but... Again, we want to quantify by how much, which is the next bullet point, which I've said now three times. So quantify by how much um, consumers and producers benefit. 